film, music, television reflect the world we live in. Critics help make sense of what we see and hear. One of the keenest observers is Wesley Morris. He is a past winner of the Pulitzer Prize for Criticism and is now critic at large at, for the New York Times and the co-host of the podcast, Still Processing. In Toronto to take part in a conversation and a masterclass at the Coffler Center of the Arts, Wesley Morris joins us now on cultural commentary and looking at art through a moral lens. Hi, hi. Hi. <laughs> As I said before we started uh, taping, I'm super excited to get the opportunity to speak to you. Well, it's nice to be here. Thanks Thank you for, for being here. Um, you studied film and literature at Yale. I did. And uh, you host a podcast where you talk about films and the broader culture. Uh-huh. Um, what role has film played in your life? Oh. Well, I mean, it was a useful way to start thinking about... Well, okay. It was you. Well, the, the thing I was going to say to you just now was uh -huh. it was a useful way to think about the world, but that's the thing you realize as, as an adult. Mm -hmm. As a kid, you realize that that there is a world in these movies, mm -hmm. and the worlds are interesting, and you can learn a lot about people mm -hmm. through the movies, and you know through art or, or about art through movies too. Um, but I didn't really understand anything about like writing about movies as a job or anything mm -hmm. like that. I just, I liked them because my mother liked them and she put them on a lot. We watched, we watched a lot of old movies because we had a, I don't know about how it is in Toronto. Uh -huh. There's a American movie classics, right. AMC. AMC, You yeah. get that. Mm -hmm. Well, back in the day when I was a kid, it was like, it was American movie classics and they played classic American movies. Mm. Whereas now it's like The Walking Dead. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like you could now. see like a Greer Garson movie on American Movie Classics. Right. And um, I watched a lot of those with my mom and I just fell in love with, I fell in love with her being in love with the movies. With the movies. And that kind of transferred to me. Well, it sounds like it was something for you to, I guess it was a bonding experience for you both, even though maybe at the time you didn't know it. I didn't know it. Yeah, but you know, when we, a lot of people say that when they watch films, like you said about giving you a perspective, like a uh, different world. Mm -hmm. um, some people say that when you watch films, you kind of escape your life. Mm -hmm. um, was that uh, something that would be fair to say about you growing up or? I, yeah, I never thought about it that way. I mean, I guess that might have been what I was doing, like moving into some some filmmaker's world or something, but I didn't understand that that was necessarily happening. I just knew that, like, for instance, I liked Goonies a lot. That was such and a just, good movie. I know. And I just wanted to I just wanted to be in that world because those kids seemed like they were having a great time. Right. And Josh Brolin. Well, <laughs> let's not get started. But who was on my, you know, my walls as a teenager? Uh, but you, in Toronto, you did a workshop for content creators. Mm -hmm. um, is it difficult to to teach criticism? Um, no. I think that the thing that's important about teaching criticism is just un having people understand that the work is there's stuff in the work mm -hmm. that you can extract and use to tell a story. Right, and you can use a particular work of art or culture, or just a moment in time, um, to explain the world in some way. Mm. And I don't know. I mean, you know, it is a talent, and there is some skill involved. But there are some basic things that you can teach people to think about. Like what? Um, well, thinking about what you think the work is trying to do. Mm -hmm. Like what if you, if the, if, the, if the thing under consideration could speak, right? If this album could tell you, this is what I like to say, some, a bad album actually will tell you this. Mm -hmm. But if there's an album that, you know, if it could speak and it could say like, this is what I'm trying to do, this is what I want to say about X, myself, the world, you know, music, whatever. You figure that out and then you basically evaluate whether it succeeds at doing the thing it seems like it's trying to do. Mm -hmm. And then if you are really feeling bold, or I think it's just a requirement of the job, but it's not something that a lot of criticism manages to do, you sort of say what the thing is actually doing. Um, do like, you need permission to do that too? Because um, if I'm mm -hmm. watching something or if I'm listening to something, mm -hmm. I might like it, mm -hmm. I might not like it, uh, but I don't know how many of us um, can say, well, I didn't like that and this is why I didn't like it. Do you need like a, uh, some permission to not like things? No, 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 but that's part of the problem, right? I think that people are afraid 
I think people are more afraid to not like something than they are to like something. Especially if everybody else likes it, right? Especially if everybody else likes it. Because now, in this, depending on where this opinion is expressed, mm -hmm. this not liking the thing that everybody else likes, people will come after you and, you know, <laughs> they will dox you. Like, you know, put That's your, when they put all your information on. Yeah, they just like put your like house number on the internet um, and say, go after this person because they didn't like, I don't know, they didn't like Kendrick Lamar's new record. This person needs to be shown how to like it properly. Mm. Um, I just think that's a problem. And I think that that is an outgrowth of this other thing that has happened in our, in, at least in the US. What's but I also think in all kinds of other places where you just feel like your your the powers that be are not responsive to the people who put them in those places. And so it's it's much easier to go to a place like Twitter and and say, and you know, you practice your own kind of criminal justice mm. or your own you pass your own laws about what you what people can and can or should or shouldn't do. Um So you're thinking more like it's coming from a, a place of anger, rage? I think powerlessness, um, helplessness. And I think that some place like Twitter actually is empowering in all kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. But I think in some of, I think some of the ways in which it's empowering are front to a kind of nuanced or, or robust or, I mean, even honest criticism um, where you feel like you, where, where as an alternative people feel like, or as a consequence, you feel like you can't say or, or, or feel the way that you honestly feel about any number of you know cultural figures or cultural works because people are going to be mad at you mm -hmm. and come after you. Do you think it's ironic that it, we're also living in a time where people seem to be very self-reflective, mm -hmm. where we step back and look at ourselves and say, you know, we criticize ourselves. We say, I can work on this, I can work on that. But when it comes to something like art, where it's kind of like, no, yeah, I see the, the way things are. That's how I see them. Yeah, well, I think that, but I don't think anybody's doing any sort of, I don't think, it, like, collectively we're doing a lot of self-reflective mm. thinking, right? I think a lot of it is just reactionary. And sometimes it has a use. But I think when it comes to art, I feel like a lot of it is a substitute for actually experiencing the thing itself. Because these conversations get started and the snowball starts rolling down the mountainside and you know, before long, you got this avalanche, and people are just—I mean, this is a horrible metaphor <laughs> because I was going to be like, people are jumping on into the avalanche. Nobody's doing it. No, no. But but people do want to have a to be part of this of some kind of conversation mm -hmm. that seems on the on its surface it seems morally right, right? If if you don't like, I mean, I'm just thinking of a specific example, right? If you don't like a painting that's in a in a museum, and you think the painting is an affront to black culture or black people or black history, in part because it was painted by a white artist, mm -hmm. and you haven't seen the painting, but you are kind of philosophically on board with the nature of the complaint then it's so easy to be like, yeah, she should never paint again. This woman should never be able to make another painting. Um, you don't know anything about the painting itself, the artist, her other work, how it fits into that. Um, what else is even in the show in which the painting is being exhibited? You just know that this painting is a problem for all these other people and therefore- It's a problem for you. Yep. Um, well, last year you wrote this uh, essay called The Morality Wars mm -hmm. that you know had a lot of people talking. Um, and in it, you start, uh, you talk about this conversation you had at dinner about the HBO <laughs> series in, uh, Insecure yes. starting Issa Rae. Yes. Uh, can you tell us about that story? I was at dinner with uh, some friends, well, a friend and some of his friends and um, I think we 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 were talking about HBO shows, and it turned into this conversation. It turned into a conversation about Insecure, and I was immediately like, "I'm waiting for this show to turn into the thing I think it's it can become." Mm -hmm. And this person was like, "What do you mean?" And I said, "I don't know. I'm just I'm waiting for it to get good." And he was like, "But it's already good," and I'm like, "I, I don't agree with you. Mm -hmm. It's it's not good yet," and his. It was becoming clear that his belief in its in its already goodness was the fact that it existed, right? That this black woman 
was being given something that virtually no other black American women have been given an opportunity to do. And it's, which so, is, and it's based on her life. And it's based on her life yeah. and it's written, it's most like, it, she's a producer on it, mm -hmm. it she's created the show, um, she stars in it. Mm -hmm. I just wanted it to do more and he was satisfied with where it was. And the, the, the thing that he wanted me to understand was that I didn't, I could not not like this thing because there was too much at stake in, in having people not like it because the thing that matters is that there's a black woman on TV. On HBO. On HBO yeah. in a comedy, yeah. so I should shut up. Well, in that essay you write, uh, the culture wars back then always seemed to be about keeping culture from kids, referring to back, back in the day. Yeah. Now the moral panic appears to flow in the opposite direction. The moralizers are young people, not their parents. Um, what has this shift in discourse meant for critics like yourself? Um, I think it means having to defend a lot. Uh, it, it can mean two things. I think it can mean any number of things, but two things of those any number of things include not feeling like you can be honest about how you feel about a particular work because people, what, I'm, what I call in that piece, the moralizers will come after you. Um, but it also is the fear that you are under attack for just expressing an opinion about a work of art. And just doing your job, because you're critics, so you have to. Yeah, but that part, people don't, that, nobody's here for like, it's your job. Mm -hmm. Like the, the, I think that there's a way that the people's understanding of how a process is supposed to work, mm -hmm. that doesn't, I mean, you have to kind of disclaim or or have prefatory remarks before almost anything. Not not all the time, but I think it's people don't really understand that you know you're a critic mm -hmm. and your job is to basically review something. And like at this dinner, for instance, I don't. I mean, I didn't tell him that like I have a right to this opinion because I'm a critic. Mm -hmm. I was like, I have a right to this opinion because I'm a, a viewer. Who, well, I'm paying HBO <laughs> to give me a show, and right. the show should be good. Right. And if I don't think it's good, you and I can sit here and talk about. Why that why is. Why that is, or like why it isn't. But you can't tell me that I can't say what I want to say mm -hmm. or how I feel mm -hmm. because- For the culture. Because we're both, we're two black people and this is a black woman and therefore I can't criticize her mm -hmm. for not being funny enough. Well, writer, uh, Slate writer, uh, Inku Kang had oh, this sure. to say in Slate uh, following your essay. And she wrote, there's no doubt that the internet has in many respects coarsened conversations about movies and TV shows, but there's also no doubt that it has enriched them immeasurably by allowing populations that previously had little access to those conversations to take part. As the line between criticism and conversation grows finer, it's imperative to acknowledge how discussions about representation have deepened criticism, not replaced it, as Morris alleges. Um, how does a critic like yourself respond to criticism? Uh, by accepting that that I'm open to it. <laughs> Do you, what she said, is it fair what she said? Um, well, I feel like that, it's not unfair. I think that, but I'm not saying that there, it isn't that, that, I mean, that is a nice turn of phrase. I just don't think it is exactly accurate in terms of what I was arguing, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that this question of representation has entirely replaced criticism. I just don't know that in a lot of cases it's made it stronger because what you're talking about isn't the work under consideration as a work. You're looking at it in terms of, of, of how successfully it checks the boxes that the human resources department at the studio needs to check in a lot of cases. Or that's a slightly cynical way of putting the, the happier and more positive thing, which is that there are people being represented in popular culture now who have, who have never been represented by any movies and television shows, mm -hmm. right? And that is an achievement. But I think the only way for the achievement to really have legs and to matter is to be able to talk honestly and openly about what works and doesn't work about it the way you would any other work of popular culture. You can't, I mean, at some point you can't treat the, this, this special work as, as debilitatingly special, right? Like it has to be able to withstand the same criticism you give to like a Batman movie or something, right? Mm -hmm. Crazy Rich Asians should be able to be a movie that people should feel comfortable saying they do not like, 
for any number of reasons. And you shouldn't have to go to like opinion jail for not thinking that it's being Asian is enough. Well, speaking of opinion jail, um, there's a lot of conversation <laughs> about canceling certain artists like Kanye West, R. Kelly, mm -hmm. uh, Kevin Hart. Uh, what does it mean to cancel someone? I don't know. That depends on that depends on who the artist is, right? I think there are some people who it's easy to cancel, or to, to you know quote cancel. But I don't know what it. If you're R. Kelly, I do think that something like the Mute R. Kelly campaign works and is successful in that it is a call to take his music off the table so that you can talk about the transgressions that he is accused of having committed against these women mm -hmm. and girls. Mm -hmm. And I think that that, is, that was a really successful, that in combination with the documentary that Lifetime aired with, I think they were successful ways of refocusing a conversation that people had been trying to get us to have for a long time about this person. Mm -hmm. um, so the call for taking his music off the table is, is actually shrewd. Um, but that isn't, I, I don't know, I don't know what it would mean to cancel a Kevin Hart, right? Like, he, he's not hosting the Oscars, I think, is maybe the line that people- For Kevin were, Hart, right. yep. And he's still gonna make movies. People he's still are gonna still make gonna go money. see them. Right. So some people might say, well, what's the problem then? Um, for the can for the calls for cancellation? No, I mean for the people, because they're still gonna make money. They're still gonna go on with their lives. Well, I mean, I think it depends on I mean in Kevin Hart's case, he just he wrote some he wrote some homophobic mm -hmm. and I think transphobic tweets mm -hmm. and And he apologized and he, for them. Well. Well, I mean, he went on Ellen. <laughs> but anyway, I, I mean, I only have like one minute. I want to get one more question in. Uh, uh, um, when you know, when we talk about cancel culture, um, what do we lose as a society when we do cancel certain people out? Uh, that's a really interesting question, and it, I don't, I don't actually know, because I don't actually, I don't. I, what, what one thing you would lose is the voice of the person who is. I mean, depending on what the thing they're called on for being, like the th the reason they're being asked to be canceled, I mean, that matters. I think that the the artist, him or herself matters. Um, but I don't, you lose the voice in the work of that person. I mean, I'm trying to think of a, of a, of a more, like let's say that, well, I don't know, it's really easy. Like Bill Cosby, the 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 fallout of, the accusations against him basically amounted to having his entire, at least the television work, removed from streaming services. Mm -hmm. So these companies decided for us whether or not this is a person we wanted to choose to have in our lives. And I think that, I don't know, there's a part of me that really would have liked to have been forced to make that choice for myself, um, as opposed to having Netflix or you know Hulu or whoever tell me that it's good for me that I don't have to watch this person. Mm -hmm. Whereas I actually think that in the case of The Cosby Show, that show's value and its importance is so much bigger and greater and and and, and more significant than Bill Cosby. Because um, all those actors, the people who worked on the show, because the show's not being uh, shown anymore. Right, I mean, yeah. it hurts them and financially. It, yes, but also I guess what we came to believe was, it, they showed us a different uh, side of what it is to be a black family, a successful black family. Mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. think we all grew up watching it. Yes. And I just noticed that uh, all the people that I named uh, are black. Yes. Uh, do, you, do you think that uh, more black people are targeted when it comes to cancel culture? <sighs> no, but I do think that a lot of the people who are accused of, of these sorts of things happen to be black. I don't, I have not really successfully worked out the degree to which I'm uncomfortable with because we're talking about we're talking about like in some cases criminal behavior. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the the morality of people who make art that we love. I, to the degree that race matters, I think it matters only if what you're seeing is black people being persecuted and well, sorry, black people black people being prosecuted more than than white people. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that the same calls for the cancellation of various white artists has been as strong. I just think that in certain cases, like Bill Cosby and R. Kelly, um, and to some extent Michael Jackson, who is dead and you know can't re-defend himself, 
I think that those those claims are just so much more shocking and the numbers of people accusing these people are, are so high that it's hard to ignore them and they happen to be black people. But I think the problem at the root of all of these, of these transgressions is celebrity and fame. Mm -hmm. And that I think is the thing that we ought to be thinking about as much as we're thinking about race. Um, finally, uh, in your view, how can we speak truth to power without silencing others? That is a good question. Do you have an answer? Uh, nope, that's why I'm asking you. <laughs> you want a Pulitzer, why? <laughs> um, I think it's just sort of being honest. I think it's understanding that you are not the only person with an opinion on any subject, right? I think that understanding that you're part of a conversation and a discourse is really important. And I think that having people disagree with you is okay. As long as the disagreement and the, the sort of the terms of the argument and the, and the arguments themselves are above board, I think that it is perfectly possible and ultimately necessary to say that, you know, X number, per, X person in power or X famous person deserves to be checked in some way for their behavior or for their music mm -hmm. or whatever. But I think that the, I think advocating for that person and their work to be removed from the face of the earth, depending on what the, what the crime is. And even, even if you're Harvey Weinstein or Bill Cosby, I just think that there's a way that the criminal justice system, and in some ways life, they will, I mean, not always, but I mean, I think more now than ever before, at least when it comes to these sex crimes, in the US, the, the way the police treat non-famous people um, and the way that they're handled ultimately is a totally different thing. But I think that something has changed in an American moral culture so that the people accused of, and it's mostly men, of these you know, heinous crimes are, are dealt with and we are reckoning with what it means to do that. I don't know what you get when you take the work off the table because I think the work is the place where we do the reckoning in some ways, not the choice to, to delete that. Thank you so much, Wesley. I mean, I could talk to you for an hour. I could talk I wish to I you could. for an hour. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on the show. We Thanks appreciate it. Thanks for having you. me. I really like being here. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.